Hey, what's going on? It's your main man, RX Felon MD. I don't typically commit felonies, but when I do, they're drug offenses. And uh, I'm coming to you big as life and twice as ugly, as always, from my personal recording studio today. I'm actually in the park today. It's kind of overcast and rainy um, in the spring of 2023. So <clears throat> I guess I'm doing this time a new, uh, this will be the first video of it, but a new little series about public health and international drug policy. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a topic that's become near and dear to my heart over uh, the past, like, several years, anyway. Um, the basis for this is an article from The Lancet, which is, uh, like, a major medical journal. From this, It's actually kind of an old article from 2016, but um, it's called Public Health and International Drug Policy. And it really, I thought it was really good. It highlights the... Um, basically the discrepancy between the public health outcomes of drug prohibition and the war on drugs, um, basically saying that how they're, uh, they don't really, uh, the, the war on drugs does not promote good health outcomes. That's, yeah, that's the basic point, but all right, so let's get into it. Um, this talks about this this thing that happens from time to time, it's the United Nations General Assembly special session. Um, they have it like every few years, it seems like. I've just been getting into reading about it. This article actually came out right before the 2016 um, special sessions assembly. This is the United Nations. This is like a global policy making um, meeting, you know, of like major world powers. So it's it's on a global scale, of course. And uh, no, I'm not going to put a spoiler alert, but basically uh, I'll get into later how they fumbled again, once again on international drug policy at that time and how, I mean, pr they probably continue to do so. Um, but we'll get into that. So it starts by saying that in September 2015, the member states of the United Nations endorsed sustainable development goals for 2030 that aspire to human rights-centered approaches to ensuring the health and well-being of all people. Sounds good so far, right? The Sustainable Development Goals embody both the UN Charter values of rights and justice for all and the responsibility of states, states basically meaning countries, because they're talking about, like, this is a meeting of, like, many countries on the world stage. So... Uh, the responsibility of states to rely on the best scientific evidence as they seek to better humankind. So it's a pretty lofty goal and a lot of responsibility there, really. Um, in April 2016, these same states will consider control of illicit drugs, an area of social policy that has been fraught with controversy, seen as inconsistent with human rights norms, and for which scientific evidence and public health approaches have arguably played too limited a role. That's a theme in the war on drugs. It's basically put in the hands of police and lawmakers without a lot of input on uh, from public health professionals, we'll say. So, I mean, that's, I think, gradually starting to change, but that's what it's been for a long time. So, now, just a little bit of a history lesson here. The previous United Nations General Assembly Special Sessions on Drugs in 1998, so this was this is already 25 years ago, that General Assembly Special Session um, convened under the theme, quote, a drug-free world. We can do it, end quote. So the goal right there is to create a, dr a drug-free world, which is pretty ridiculous on its face. But anyway... And obviously, there's never been a drug-free world, and there never will be. So it's really kind of outrageous um, that that's even a thing, but here it is. So uh, those special sessions in 1998 endorsed drug control policies based on the goal of prohibiting all use, possession, production, and trafficking of illicit drugs. This goal enshrined in national law, uh, sorry, this goal is enshrined in national law in many countries, meaning like a heavy-handed prohibitionist approach is the standard throughout the world. So, 
Um, in pronouncing drugs a grave threat to the health and well-being of mankind, the 1998 United Nations General Assembly Special Sessions echoed the foundational 1961 convention of the international drug control regime, which justified eliminating the evil of drugs in the name of health and welfare of mankind. So you can see how far back this goes. It goes even further back than 1961, of course, but um, apparently in 1961, the UN really took to this approach um, in the name of the health and welfare of mankind. You know, like, like I say a lot, um, these sorts of policies are always pushed, you know, prohibitionist policies, war on drugs, um, types of, uh, laws and policies and enforcement, it's always done in the name of protecting the public, even though it quite patently does the opposite. So, and th that's what this article is looking into really, um, from a, you know, scientific and public health standpoint. So, um, the article says that neither of these international agreements refers to the ways in which pursuing drug prohibition itself might affect public health. The war on drugs and zero tolerance policies that grew out of the prohibitionist consensus are now being challenged on multiple fronts, including their health, human rights, and development impact. Uh, the Johns Hopkins and Lancet Commission, so those are two pretty big names in the you know scientific and medical community, the Lancet and Johns Hopkins. Um, their commission on drug policy and health has sought to examine the emerging scientific evidence on public health issues arising from drug control policy and to inform and encourage a central focus on public health evidence and outcomes in drug policy debates, such as the important deliberations of the 2016 United Nations General Assembly Special Sessions on Drugs. And like I said, I'll get into more of like some things that happened there um, that really weren't conducive to, uh, much progress in this, in this regard from where we're coming from with this, like I was saying. Uh, the Johns Hopkins Lancet Commission is concerned that drug policies are often colored by ideas about drug use and drug dependence that are not scientifically grounded. The 1998 declaration, for example, like the UN drug conventions and many national drug laws, including those in the United States, of course, does not distinguish between drug use and drug abuse. Those are kind of old fashioned terms anyway, but a lot of people still use them. So a 2015 report by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, by contrast, found it is important to emphasize that, quote, drug use is neither a medical condition nor does it necessarily lead to drug dependence, end quote. The idea that all drug use is dangerous and evil has led to enforcement heavy policies and has made it difficult to see potentially dangerous drugs in the same light as potentially dangerous foods, tobacco, alcohol, for which the goal of social policy is to reduce potential harm. So that's important there because generally the way we treat alcohol, tobacco, um, and a lot of foods, you know, there's a lot of bad foods out there. Um, there's an obesity epidemic and a lot of health problems that result from basically people eating bad foods to excess, we'll say, which oddly enough, I mean, I believe food addiction is a real thing. And, um, it basically has similar, you know, when you eat crappy foods that taste really good, it gives you a dopamine hit in your brain, like not too dis, you know, not dissimilarly to how drugs will do it. I mean, I'm not saying they're not the same thing, but, um, food addiction is real and, you know, we can have whatever foods we want pretty much and tobacco and alcohol. So the goal should be to reduce societal harms. I mean, I don't know if anyone's calling for the outlawing of Twinkies, you know, but I mean, you can draw a parallel there, but whatever, that's just, that's just my, my little soapbox of that. But, um, the article goes on to say that health impact of drug policy based on enforcement of prohibition. That's the next section. Um, and now this is important. I've talked about this before. We saw this um, clearly during the alcohol prohibition days of the United States from now a hundred years ago. The pursuit of 
And you could just literally substitute drug and alcohol together because in the end, alcohol is just another drug, you know, albeit a legal one, a regulated one. And um, generally, I think our society does a pretty good job with regulating alcohol. And there's a lot of tax money there too for the government. So anyway, uh, the pursuit of drug prohibition has generated a parallel economy run by criminal networks. Both these networks, which resort to violence to protect their markets and the police and sometimes military or paramilitary forces that pursue them, contribute to violence and insecurity in communities affected by drug transit and sales. Uh, for example, in Mexico, the dramatic increase in homicides, and remember, this is from 2016. This has only gotten worse since. Um, in Mexico, the dramatic increase in homicides since the government decided to use military forces against drug traffickers in 2006 has been so great that it reduced life expectancy in the country. So literally so many people, even in 2016, were getting murdered in Mexico and therefore dying prematurely, that when you look at the statistics, the life expectancy in Mexico has gone down um, because of all, these, all this violence based on the war on drugs and, and Mexico using military force, particularly against drug traffickers. You can see that all over the news. It's still going on. It's, it's crazy. But anyway, just trying to draw a little light to that, I guess. Um, and this goes on to talk about uh, another related public health thing, but to the prohibition of uh, drugs and even paraphernalia, injection equipment, stuff like that. Um, injection of drugs with contaminated equipment is a well-known route of HIV exposure and viral hepatitis transmission. Um, hepatitis especially, like hep C and hep B, um, are very linked to injection drug use. I know in this area, a lot of the people that I've known that have used injection drugs have hep C. Um, and, and occasionally a person's body will clear it. And now there's treatments for, he or like there's a cure for hep C now, but there wasn't for a long time. And it seemed like just about everybody with a history of injection drug use also had, was positive for hep C. Um, and that's a terrible illness to have long-term. Um, you can live with it for a long time, but I mean, it tends to lead to liver failure and liver cancers and early death, you know, later on in life, especially if not before. Um, so anyway, that not, not even to mention HIV, there's been multiple HIV, um, outbreaks in, in this area, meaning like the, tr we'll say the tri-state area or like Southern West Virginia, Huntington, Charleston. Um, uh, I've read about them in the news and it's, um, in a lot of ways it's con uh, connected to injection drug use. So people who inject drugs are also at high risk of tuberculosis. The continued spread of unsafe injection linked HIV, which is what I was just talking about, contrasts the progress that has been seen in reducing sexual and vertical transmission of HIV in the last three decades. So um, there's been a drop in sexually transmitted HIV and vertical transmission of HIV. Vertical means from like the mother to the baby. So, but there's been an increase in uh, needle, you know, contaminated needle based transmission of HIV from, from drug use, injection drug use. I mean, um, the commission found that the repressive drug policing greatly contributes to the risk of HIV linked to inf uh, injection. So let me say that again, repressive drug policing, that means like anti-paraphernalia laws, anti-drug laws, greatly contributes to the risk of HIV. Um, and of course, hep C and hep B from injection drug use. Uh, policing may be a direct barrier to barrier to services such as needle and syringe programs, like needle exchange programs. Um, we've seen that happen here. I'm pretty sure it was in Charleston, West Virginia. They had to shut down their needle exchange because of um, public and police pressure to to do it. So um, that's an uphill battle with stuff like that. But needle exchange gives people clean needles to use in exchange for their old ones. 
and is well known to help prevent the spread of communicable diseases via injection and sharing of needles. If there's not enough needles around and people want to use drugs with the needle, they're going to share them, you know, and that's, that's how people catch, um, bloodborne diseases like HIV and hepatitis. So, uh, and it also says policing may be a direct barrier to services such as, um, opioid substitution therapy, uh, like in this country, methadone and suboxone programs. Um, and interestingly, this article um, states something that I've I've heard of happening around here. I don't know if it's still going on, but it definitely used to in the past. If you ask people around here that that were going there like ten years ago, um, police seeking to boost arrest totals have been found to target facilities that provide opioid substitution therapy services to harass and detain large numbers of people who use drugs. Drug paraphernalia laws that prohibit possession of injecting equipment lead people who inject drugs to fear carrying syringes and force them to either share the equipment or dispose of it unsafely. Policing practices undertaken in the name of the public good have demonstrably worsened public health outcomes. So what I was saying about the police harassing people like it was well known at the methadone clinic in Huntington that the police would sit like outside of it or up the road from it and then would like harass people that were leaving there. People going there for treatment. I mean, of course, there was probably some element of like illicit drug use or possession or whatever going on there, too. But they would really hassle people and pull them over and sometimes arrest them for various things based on the fact that they were leaving the methadone clinic. The cops would see them come out of the parking lot and then would just pull them over and whatever, you know, search them or give them a DUI or, I mean, all sorts of things, really. Um, really sad to think about, you know. Um, so that's what they're saying. This uh, is one of the negative effects of this type of policing. So... Um, and then it goes on to say, among the most significant impacts of pursuit of drug prohibition identified by the commission in this article with respect to infectious disease is the excessive use of incarceration as a drug control measure. Many national laws impose lengthy custodial sentences for minor nonviolent drug offenses. So this is kind of written like, I think it was, might have had British contribution because they call it a custodial sentence. A custodial sentence just means that you're in custody, like a prison sentence or a jail sentence or something like that. Um, and, you know, the drug laws tend to be draconian. You can get many, many years of incarceration for a drug trafficking offense, even if it's relatively minor. Um, and even for drug possession, you can get... Um, sometimes year a simple possession you could even theoretically get um at least a couple years for it and we see that happen all the time actually so they're just saying that incarceration is being used as a drug control measure i mean never mind the fact that you can get drugs in jail and prison too so and that's one of the arguments people make is if you can't keep drugs out of jails and prisons we're like for the most part they're being smuggled in by people who work in the jail. So, I mean, if you can't keep them out of these custodial facilities, how are you going to keep them off the streets? It's just impossible. So, uh, we definitely need a better way. So this also goes on to say that, um, people who use drugs are overrepresented in prison and pretrial detention, drug use and drug injection occur in prisons, although their occurrence is often denied by officials. HIV and hepatitis C transmission occurs among prisoners and detainees, often complicated by co-infection with TB, and in many places, multidrug-resistant TB, that's tuberculosis, uh, and too few states offer prevention or treatment services in spite of international guidelines that urge comprehensive measures, including provision of injection equipment for people in state custody. So um, international guidelines actually urge provision of injection equipment to people in custody. I mean, that's, I've read a couple articles about places where they've done that and it's been helpful, but I mean, that is not the norm. 
you know, quite the opposite. So you end up with people making like homemade needles, homemade syringes in prisons, or just passing a syringe around if people in prison get some drugs and want to shoot up. Um, and this sort of thing happens all the time. And that's at least worldwide. I mean, in this country too, for sure. But um, that is a prime way that people catch bloodborne diseases. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, the article basically goes on to say that due to the high rates of, I mean, among other reasons, really, like, even though the fact that, like, the punishment doesn't really fit the crime, like, if you have a consensual drug transaction, it doesn't really create a victim, so I don't know why someone would need to be locked up for that anyway, but that's what we do. So, uh, they're, they're saying that since there's a lot of this disease transmission and unsafe drug use that goes on in custody, that um, at the very least, drug offenders should be um, given alternatives to prison for minor drug offenses and and be assured access to medication-assisted treatment. They call it opioid substitution therapy, but call it what you will, in in custody. And that's that's starting to happen in the United States in some places, but it's still it's still very underutilized with the massive amount of drug users and people addicted to drugs that are, you know, put into custody all the custody all the time, frequently for drug offenses. So, um, and they also say that a seamless link from prison services to opioid substitution therapy in the community would also be important. So, um, even if they get like say a suboxone program in, in a prison, they would need to have a really, um, solid connection to a provider in the, you know, outside of the prison for when those people get released. So, and that's, that's, a, they're, they're also saying it's a, it's a dangerous time when somebody just gets released from jail or prison. Um, that a lot of overdoses and a lot of, um, disease transmission occurs in the period following incarceration in, in like the early stages following incarceration. So anyway, um, the article goes on to talk more about like um, discrimination of against racial and ethnic ethnic minorities in countries and gender differences and stuff like that, and then uh, talks about overdoses and stuff like that. So I'm already at 22 minutes on this one. Um, I'm gonna make this into a series. So. Uh, if you've gotten this far, I really appreciate you listening. Stay tuned for uh, the subsequent videos on this. Uh, I hope you enjoy them. Hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel, please, if you would. That would be doing me a solid if you like this sort of content. And uh, remember, the future is uncertain. The end is always near. So be careful out there. Take care. RX Felon MD out for now. Peace.